Life is like a coin. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. You got one life. You can spend it any way you want, like a coin, but you only spend it once. Make sure you invest it, not just spend it on something that matters. God is the most planningest person in the universe. Sovereignty, God has a plan. Did you know in the mind of God, Jesus Christ was crucified before the foundation of the earth? Because it's part of a plan. All the way Jesus Christ, is, he's walking on earth, doing his thing. They try to get him, he says, my time has not yet come. You, it's not time for the plan. The Bible says, in fullness of time, Jesus was born of a woman under the law at just the right time. Because God is unfolding a plan. Spiritual people plan. It's not carnal to plan. If God has given you a vision, he expects you to develop a plan for fulfilling it. You get a vision for a new house. You want a new house. And you see it. You see the house. You see the rooms. You see the layout. You see everything. 5,000 beautiful square feet. Somebody been having some visions up in here. 5,000 beautiful square feet of house. Plush. That's a, that's, a, that's a vision. You see it. Hopefully you can afford it. <laughs> and so you've got this plan to fulfill this calling, so to speak, for a new house based on this vision that you see. And you can see it. You dream about it. It keeps you up at night. I'd like to make one recommendation. That you get an architect involved with this. Because if you don't plan that construction, you're going to wind up with the ugliest 5,000 square foot house that you still got to pay for. Because things have to be related to other things properly. It must be planned. He's going to sit down. When we, when we you know, uh, are working on our building across the street, we've been spending hours and hours and hours and hours and hours planning. Visions do not negate plans. Visions inspire them. The 20th century will be remembered for one of its greatest leaders, Martin Luther King. He embodies all of his principles when it comes to this principle of calling. There was a burden. The burden was for the ongoing presence of race, racism, Jim Crow, segregation, and injustices in the nation in general, in the South in particular. A prayer meeting was called to pray about what ought to be done. What would God have be done to address this need of people? The prayer meeting was bigger than Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was the circumstance that ignited it. But the reality is she was not the only person that got bumped from the front of the bus. She just was the one that got advertised. But that led to a plan. And the plan would be, let's start with a bus boycott. And it spread and it spread and all the way, as you see in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah prays all through the book. He says, and my enemies came, so I went to God. He's always praying throughout the book because he doesn't need God just to start the vision. He needs God to stay with him in it. And I'll never forget seeing Bull Connors with his dogs and with the hoses 
and the people getting on their knees, talking to God. There was a future-oriented vision And the timing was right. One final thought, your commitment to your vision. Let me turn to another well-known story in the book of Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. God had told Moses, I'm going to take you to the promised land. In fact, we'll start in chapter 13. It says, I'm going to take you to the promised land and I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, send you over there and I've got this thing laid out for you. This is the vision. You've never been there before. You've never seen it, but let me give you the vision. So my calling is for you to lead the people to the promised land. Let me describe, let me let you see it. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. That simply is a euphemism that means this is a highly productive piece of property. You won't go hungry here. It's flowing. And I had already worked out the details for you because I got some unrighteous folk out there and I told them to dig some wells. So the wells have already been dug. I, I, I didn't got the sinners to lay it out for the saints when the saints are ready to claim it. So it's all laid out for you. I want you to see it, dream it, and now I'm calling you to lead the people to it. But I want you to get a picture of it first. That's the vision. The calling was to lead the people. Now he says, he says to them in chapter 13, I want you, verse 2, send out for yourself men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of the tribes, each one a leader among them. So you send me out 12 leaders. Because the leaders are supposed to set the pace for the people. So you send me out 12 leaders who get out there and spy out the land. Now, this spying out the land was not to discuss whether God was going to give them the land. Because he says, no, you spy out the land which I am going to give you. So the vision is a sure vision. But I want you to be involved in the process, see what you're getting into. Because I want you to develop strategies for taking over the land. Then they came back, all 12 of them. And we have the majority report and the minority report. All right? Let's look at the, the report, verse 25 of chapter 13. When they returned from spying out the land, at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, and they brought back word to them, and all the congregation showed them uh, the fruit of the land. So they went back and got a little sample. We'll call this a, a vision sample. All right? And they said, we went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. Look how big these apples are. This, is, this land is like something we've never seen before. So, so what God wanted them to get was a little down payment. Nevertheless, watch out for the nevertheless folk. When it comes to your vision, let them nevertheless their vision, not nevertheless your vision, all right? Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. The cities are fortified. They're large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, they're living in the hill country. Then the Canaanites are living by the sea and the side of the Jordan. In other words, we got problems. Yeah, the land is exactly what it says there, but you got to see these folk. These folk are all over the place. The minority report is, while what God said is true, it's not practical. It's true. The land is flowing with milk and honey, but it's not practical. Why? Because there's too much opposition. Let's listen to the minority report. Verse 30. 
Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. Caleb said, no, 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 no. God has already spoken it. We've already seen it. It's time to go get it. That's the minority report. Now let me tell you where Moses made a mistake, in my humble opinion. Moses made one mistake. He took a vote. You never vote on the will of God. Don't take votes on your vision if it's from God. Now, if, if you're not sure it's from God and you need some counseling, that's, uh, counselors, that's one thing. But when you know it's from God, it's not up for a vote. It's not up for a vote. But the men, verse 31, who had gone with him, were not able, we are not able to go up against the people. They are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out. Now they start lying making up stuff, discouraging folk. Look, if you're going to discourage folk, go by yourself and discourage you. <laughs> Don't transport it. He says in verse 33, we saw them and we are like grasshoppers. We call this the grasshopper mentality. We're grasshoppers in our own sight. You know why? Because they weren't looking at God's vision, they were looking at their ability. That's the problem. That's the problem. Now, I am not a big person on I can't. I can't, those words kind of like make me nervous. When I hear folks say that, I can't, I get a little nervous like that. You know, cause, Cause for me to accept you can't, you gotta have a real good reason. Now we can't do a lot of things, so I know the things we can't do, but you gotta have a reason. Don't tell me you can't because nobody ever did it before. The Wright brothers were the first ones to fly. Nobody had ever flown before. I mean, don't tell me you can't because you're a first. Don't tell me you can't because, you know, that's, that's, a, a, that's like the Dallas Cowboys saying, we can't go anywhere because 11 other men on the other side of the ball lined up to stop us. And? That's like the Mavericks saying, we can't win because there's too much Carl Malone. And? That does not deny the reality that, you know, there's still areas in our society that are oppressive and that are not fair. But the issue is, did the vision come from God? Because if it came from God, it doesn't matter how fortified Jericho is. This I can't stuff. The question is, is it a vision from God? So they got the minority report. One was optimistic, one was pessimistic. They came, they saw the same land, but came to two different conclusions. But Joshua and Caleb could see what the others could not. Now let me tell you what happens when you don't accept your vision. Chapter 14, verse 29. Your corpses shall fall in the wilderness. And guess what? For 40 years, they got to go in circles in the wilderness because they wouldn't accept the vision. Don't be 60, 70 years old saying you came to Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship and you're still walking in circles. Amen. That you accepted. You accepted the least of your ability. You accepted the, the, the lowest that you could go. You never dreamt a dream. You never saw anything bigger than you. You never, you never saw that you could go and, and, and fly high for God because he never had the freedom to dream his dreams in your head. You don't have to turn there, but some, tonight read Joshua 14, verses 7 to 12. Joshua 14, 7 to 12. This is 40 years later. Now watch this. Caleb is now 85 years old. He's 40 years old when this happens. He's 85 in Joshua chapter uh, uh, 14, verses 7 through 11. Now they're in the promised land under Joshua. Caleb comes to Joshua and says, Joshua, you remember? You remember, you see, all them other boys, they, they didn't see it. So they all died in the wilderness. But now you and I are in the promised land. And he says, Joshua, I'm 85. 
I was 40 when this thing came down, but I am as strong now as I was at 40. Because even if other folk try to stop God from expressing his vision through you, he will keep you around till he get rid of them so he can still do through you what he wants to get done. He says, I am 85 years old. I'm as strong now. I have continued to follow the Lord. And then he looks over and he says, Joshua, you see that mountain over there? All that hill country over there? That's mine. You give all that to me. That's, my, that's what I've been dreaming about. And that's mine. Now, notice what he said at 85. He didn't say, give me this rocking chair. Give me this medical bed that goes up and down. He said, give me this mountain because I'm enjoying this thing. He said, I'm old, but I ain't cold. I'm going to enjoy this thing that I've waited so long to get. It's a long wait. When you get a vision, it'll change your priorities. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Life is like a coin. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. Did you hear me? You got one life. You can spend it any way you want, like a coin. But you only spend it once. Make sure you invest it, not just spend it on something that matters. A goof off on the high school football team. He hardly practiced. He hardly worked. He hardly did anything. He was just there for the ride. It was the championship game. Everyone knew the goof off wouldn't play, but he was out there on the field and he was a halfback and he was like fourth string. The only problem is in the championship game, the first string got hurt, the second string got hurt, and the third string got hurt. All in the first quarter. So now they've only got one halfback left. It's the old goof off. They call him into the game and the boy goes crazy. The boy is running over people, under people, around people. The coach cannot believe it. He has never seen athleticism like old goof off. What then got into the boy? The game is over. The coach comes to him after the game and said, look, look, I, excuse me, I, I have certainly underrated you. I don't, you've been around here a long time. I do not understand what I just saw today. How were you able to do that? He said, coach, let me explain. My daddy's blind. My daddy died yesterday. This is the first day he gets to see me play. When you know daddy is watching, it affects how you play. When you know daddy is watching, it affects how hard you go. When you know daddy is watching, it affects your eternal determination. I'm here to submit to you as you go on in your life. Daddy's watching. You play hard because you've only got one life. You can spend it any way you can, but you only get to spend it 